All right, coming up next, I'm joined by my colleague, news editor Jesse Carvith, where we're going to talk about a four-hour marathoner making the Paris Olympic Marathon, a unsportsmanlike Canadian controversy, Netflix giving track the Drive to Survive docuseries-style treatment, and finally, anti-sex beds at the Olympics. All right, I'm here with our news editor, Jesse Carbeth. We're going to talk about uh, a few stories that you've been covering over the last few days on the site. Very first one I wanted to talk about. It's a story that's near and dear to our heart, a subject that we've covered quite a bit in the past. It's the, the plight of the Olympian, the financial dire straits that Olympians find themselves in, and the news outlet Al Jazeera did a, or what we thought was a very nice job doing a deep dive on the financial difficulties of making it to these upcoming Paris Olympics. They featured, they even featured a marathoner, the American marathoner by the name of Ashley Ull Levitt, who had to resort to having a friend set up a GoFundMe for her to raise money so she could make it to run the Paris Olympics. Only one problem with this, Jesse. Yeah, Ashley O. Levitt is not an Olympic marathoner. So, (laughs) yeah, believe it or not, her and her friend Audrey Mayhew kind of stretched the truth a bit on Ashley's Olympic journey. So Audrey Mayhew, uh, her friend, started a GoFundMe page uh, to expense uh, the Olympic marathon for her friend Ashley. And Ashley went to two news outlets, Al Jazeera uh, and one other, and kind of misled them on the reality of the story. She continued saying she was running the Olympic marathon, um, and one news outlet even called her a New York City marathon legend. However, she's a a four-hour and change marathoner. So as you might guess, she's not going to the Olympic marathon. She's not representing the United States. She didn't even go to Olympic trials, didn't qualify, didn't race there. Where she is running is the uh, Marathon Pour Tout in Paris, which is just another marathon that's open to the public. Um, It's just held on the Olympic course and it's in between the men's and women's marathon. Um, So it's actually kind of impressive. I'll, I'll give Audrey Mayhew this, she's already raised $1,500 for Ashley to get there, but uh, yeah, had to stretch the truth a bit. Yeah, I don't know what's more appalling that these two people did this or that Al Jazeera just totally bit on this without doing a, like a simple Google search as the intrepid folks at on the Let's Run forums did. Uh, that's sort of what blew this, this thing wide open. Uh, I mean... If you cover this, even casually cover this sport or follow the sport at all, you know that uh, Ashley Ull Levitt is not somebody who made the Olympic squad. Uh, only three people uh, on both the men's and the women's side each make the Olympic team for the U.S. max. And yeah, certainly not somebody who's running close to five hours. Like uh, her, some of her her performances were. She ran the Space Coast Marathon a couple of times, and 4.10 looks like it's probably her uh, her greatest feat as a marathoner, and then 4.54 gave her New York City Marathon legend status <laughs> as far as the Al Jazeera reporting went. I don't know what the hell went on with Al Jazeera on this one, whether or not it was like they're just feeding this thing into a, into some sort of like chat bot, like chat GPT or something to write the story, or the person just who was reporting on this just didn't do their job and didn't do a simple Google search, didn't fact check at all. Uh, but yeah, like, um, this is pretty brutal. Like it's pretty brutal that they, that they, they, they fell, fell for this one. And in fact, I noticed that I noticed Al Jazeera, I mean, after a couple of days and getting kind of like getting killed on the internet for it, they did, didn't retract the story, but they deeply edited the story to remove Levitt from it. Um, and then they put up a disclaimer saying that they had to make changes. Same with the uh, GoFundMe page. Now it says that she's running the marathon on the Olympic course and that she's running the Marathon Bull 2, not the actual Olympic marathon that 
the best in the world will be running. So both, both ends have made corrections after being called out, it seems. I mean, Levitt, so all Levitt was interviewed by Al Jazeera and I was able to dig up the, uh, I went in the Wayback machine and looked at the story before it got re redacted and it, it says things that are like semi true, like hundreds of thousands of people try to get a handful of marathon spots. It was such a long shot. All Levitt told Al Jazeera. It's like, yeah, th that is true. Cause the marathon part two was like a, a hotly, uh, contested in its own way in terms of just like lottery entries and people trying to, to score a spot because it's like kind of a cool experience to be able to run on the Olympic, uh, course in between the actual Olympic races. And I, I imagine hundreds of thousands of people did enter in the lottery to try to get a spot. Uh, but I, she kind of led them to believe that she was an elite athlete. Um, you know, and she says like, Marathon build when I'm in when I'm in a marathon build, it's very time consuming. <laughs> Which yeah. again, also true. Very time consuming. <laughs> yeah, it's like these things are true. Just the context in which you're sharing them and the kind of tone is a little misleading. Yeah. Yeah. To offset the costs of getting to the games, she turned to go to to crowdfunding platform GoFundMe. God, yeah. Well, uh, this actually this actually isn't the first time that uh, her friend Audrey Mayhew has set up a GoFundMe and actually had some success with it. Back in 2017, uh, Audrey raised over seven thousand dollars to get herself to Ironman World Championships. But then it gets better because when she did, after raising all that money, she decided to ride the course on a fat bike. So that's not a fast road bike. It's a bike with really, really thick tires, almost like a mountain bike, uh, that was decorated in emoji stickers, baskets, and stuffed animals. So yeah, right. Very so impressive. This gives me the, like kind of this vibe that like these two are maybe, you know, pretty interested in exactly what's happening here, which is uh, residual residual attention, even if it's in the short term, negative attention, you know, the kind of like one of the influencer ploys, like we, we covered a story a couple of weeks ago about an influencer that banded the, uh, what, what was it? The Brooklyn half? One of the, one yeah, of the, uh, yeah, the Brooklyn and, half. yeah, it was either the Brooklyn half or the, yeah, I think it was the Brooklyn half, not the, yeah. not the NYC half, but, um, and then it kind of leaked out afterwards or, or actually a, a little bit of, uh, um, uh, sort of extra snooping by one of our colleagues uh, uh, revealed that she was kind of talking about how she was doing that on purpose. She, she knew it was kind of a, the abandoning itself was a plant to get attention mm -hmm. and to get people like us upset and talking about her so that it kind of reverberated and got even more social media blowback and attention because it's the old adage, like, you know, any uh, any publicity is good publicity. It's good publicity. Right? So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I don't wonder if that's a little bit of the case here as well. But uh, perhaps let's just hope this is the first and last time we talk about Ashley All Levitt. We wish her the luck, the the best of luck in the marathon part part part, uh, part two. It's like, you know, maybe she'll um, maybe she'll become a, a marathon uh, part two legend. If, uh, if she's able to throw down a, a PR in Paris. Yeah. Maybe break four. Maybe we'll see her at the next Olympics. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Nothing is impossible. All exactly. right. We'll, we'll take a quick break and then we'll get right into an unsportsmanlike Canadian. That's uh, a subject that's going to fire us both up as uh, <laughs> two two Canadians. I was going to call us Canucks, but I don't know if I've ever referred to myself as a Canuck or any other Canadian as a Canuck before, but we'll talk about that after the break. This episode is brought to you by marathonhandbook.com where we've got a whole lot going on on all the channels right now. If you don't already subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, and you'll get notifications on all the stuff that we're putting up. We're pretty busy on there, putting up new content every single day. There is the video version of this podcast. Maybe you're watching right now. And if you're not, check it out. We put out a video version of every single pod that we do, including we dice it up into little clips so you can watch single clips as well if you prefer. 
and our shoe reviewer Alex hosts a video review every Monday. Uh, they come out mid morning every single Monday, and the latest one that he's got coming is for an old favorite, the Brooks Ghost. I believe it's in number 16 right now. And I know what you're thinking Brooks Ghost. Why would I watch a video review of a Brooks Ghost, especially in its 16th edition? Well, Alex does a really good job at uh, at breaking it down, and he does it in a very entertaining manner. It's it's excellent. You got to watch it. And finally, subscribe to our newsletter if you don't already. 160 plus thousand people subscribe to it. We send it out three times a week. You'll get notifications on when new episodes of the podcast come out, uh, and other videos uh, that we put on our YouTube channel as well as the stories that my colleague uh, Jesse Carveth is covering on our site on a daily basis. All right, let's get back into the pod. All right, and we're back. Next topic. This one's going to hit both of us pretty hard, Jesse. We're both Canadians. And I think Canadian as Canadians, we pride ourselves in our uh, our politeness, so we call it Canadian politeness. It's like a, it's nationally branded. It's a nationally branded <laughs> version of politeness. Yeah. And, uh, and this one's a shocker for us, a, a top Canadian collegiate athlete in the U S so something that we can be proud of, you know, a Canadian going to perhaps the highest level of competition, a collegiate athlete could face globally going to the U S and competing in, in division one in the NCAA uh, Michael Roth, 400 meter runner, pretty good runner. Uh, and he gets DQ'd in a 400 meter race. What happened? So he had a great lead or great lead. He was at his conference championships right towards the end of the race. He checks his shoulder, looks at his competitor and gives him some sort of hand gesture. Now the video is pretty blurry. Uh, so it's hard to tell exactly what he did, but in my opinion, it almost kind of looks like a thumbs down, which is pretty un-Canadian of him if you ask me. Um, but I can't confirm that because like I said, the video is super blurry. But um, yeah, he crossed the line, he won, and then he was DQ'd. And he ran a really good time too. He ran a 45.78, uh, which is not too far off the A standard for the Olympics. Um, but yeah, ended up getting disqualified and then his school pulled him from the four by four relay after that. And they ended up not qualifying. They probably would have had a better chance if he was there cause they're one of his best sprinters. Um, but yeah, it was a pretty harsh DQ. I think, what do you think about, do you think he deserved the DQ? Yeah. I mean, I watched this thing like the, like the Zapruder film. I wanted to slow it down and try to like <laughs> zoom in. And if I had some sort of like, you know, science fiction technology where I could like, um, uh, improve the resolution of the frames so that I could study what the hand movement was, I would have done it. I don't know. Like I, I kind of wanted to talk about this one because, um, there's a tendency in our sport, particularly on the track for the, uh, what I would call the, like the, 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 the wonderful folks who volunteer their time and pull up the high white socks to officiate, but then also kind of get in the way. And while in other sports referees can sort of, uh, offer quite a bit of drama and can play the villain. Like I think about in like basketball in particular in the NBA, the referee often can sort of be uh, the heel in, in the story of the game. I feel like in track most of the time, it's just whenever an, whenever an officiant makes a call that disrupts or alters the outcome, it's, it's just doing nothing but hurt the sport. So like I, yeah, I feel like I, I watched this a few times. I have to say, the the story popped in, in into our Slack. We went back and forth on it. I had not watched the uh, the video clip on X, um, and I, I just want to call it Twitter. I think I think I'm just going to keep calling it Twitter on Twitter. And uh, I was expecting much worse. You know, we okayed the story. It was like great. Let's let's do a story on this. This is interesting. And then I watched the video clip and I was like, this is even more interesting because I don't think this is that big a deal. Like, yeah, was he being a dick? Yes, he was being a dick. But like, 
he still ran the, the performance. I think that like you should definitely be DQ'd if you impede on someone else's performance. Uh, if you do something that's like giving you a, uh, a real edge, like stepping on the inside of the track, I guess technically would technically you're cutting the course a little bit in a track race. If you step on the inside of the track uh, or, or, or if you step inside out, out of your lane, um, but this didn't really hurt anybody. Yeah, sure. It pissed off his competitors, uh, but it, and it kind of makes him look like a villain, but I think that's kind of a, in a weird way, a good thing for the sport, if you know what I mean. And like, it didn't hurt his performance and he already won the race. So, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. Like, I think, um, I think my thing with this is if you remember my rules are rules take from last episode, yep. I was looking at the rules and the, the only thing I could really find was like, you're not allowed like unsportsmanlike conduct and whatnot. And I'm like, I feel like that's just so subjective. And I feel like at a race that big, like it takes so much work to get there that like a little celebration, even if it's maybe not the nicest thing to do, it, it's still kind of warranted. Like it's still valid. I think he's, it, he shouldn't have gotten the DQ for it. Um, yeah, especially with my rules are rules. It's pretty subjective there. I think where I kind of have an issue with it mm -hmm. is the way he dealt with it on social media. So right. afterwards he like posted on his story, uh, about how it was like a soft disqualification and like he has more work to, to do and whatnot. And I think that it's okay if you have that attitude, but either a don't post about it at all on social media, just leave it. It happened. Let it be. Or B, if you have to post about it on social media, do what's politically correct. Apologize. <laughs> say, I didn't mean to be unsportsmanlike and I'm sorry to my competitors. Do, do what's politically correct, even if you have the soft disqualification opinion. So either just don't post about it at all, or if you are going to post, if you have to bring yourself attention, do it the politically correct way. Yeah. Like leave it. I mean, I, I know there's not a ton of media covering this stuff, but like, leave it to people like, like us, leave it to leave it. Michael Roth, do yourself a favor, leave it to me <laughs> to say that it was a soft dis disqualification and to trash the uh, officials on your behalf. Like you don't have to do it yourself. Yeah. Like the, leave it to the other Michael. <laughs> yeah. The, the, I mean the play here, right. This, the, it's the safe play, but it's probably the right play is what exactly you'd imagine, which is he, he just come out on, on IG, he put a post out and he'd be like, you know, uh, motions got the best of me today. I was just so proud of what we were doing as a team. And I just got really, you know, I was just really excited about my performance and the win and no disrespect meant to my competitors, blah, 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 blah. Exactly. I, I don't wonder. So when we did it, we did a story uh, a couple of pods ago about the Orange County Marathon and how the winner got yeah. disqualified for getting unofficial aid on the course from his dad biking alongside next to him. Yeah. And there was like a little mini blow up on the YouTube uh, clip from our the video pod that we do. Yeah, I and, saw that. Yeah. And there's, there's a bunch of locals that were like, there's a subtext to this story. There's like a beef between these two athletes. And I think some of them were kind of siding with the the second place finisher who got elevated to the first place finisher kind of saying like this, yeah. this guy is, you know, whatever they had their opinions about him as a person and that sort of thing. And I don't wonder if maybe there's a little bit of subtext here that, that we aren't picking up on because we're not like, you know, covering the AAC conference on a, on, on a regular basis. And we don't know like the, the, the dynamic between Roth and his competitors, uh, at the NCAA, like, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Is, is this his sort like, of MO? Like in the, in the, and the refs were just kind of like, you know, screw this guy. Like he's just gone too far with this one. We're going to DQ him and teach him a lesson. I don't know. Yeah. Like for all we know, like they could be like best friends and have, you know, just like that little, like fun beef between them and stuff. Yeah. Or they could be like mortal enemies. Yeah, yeah, and and the referees oh. have just sort of like, and the officials have watched this play out at track meet after track meet, and they're just like, you mm -hmm. know what, we're going to teach this guy a lesson. I don't know. I mean, yeah. 
Who knows? But uh, I just don't like that it hampers on our Canadian politeness. I don't think it's a good play on that one. It's a bad look, Michael Roth. It's a bad look. Yeah. You're making us look bad. We're supposed to all be super yeah. nice. We can't wear yeah, the little exactly. maple leaf on our backpacks when we go trekking through Europe anymore because people will point out like, oh, you're from that country with the guy who like did the thumbs down thing. In the that track one movie. track guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, when I'm out on rides, that's what, and I meet someone new from a different country, that's what they always say. They're like, oh, you're from Canada. You must be so nice. So... Not if you're a track athlete anymore. I know. Anyway, I don't know. I don't mind his like, I don't mind the, the, the bad boy vibes he was given off here. And, and we do need personalities and we do need, we, we need villains in the, and the drama that is uh, track and field. But, uh, mm-hmm. and I, I think, yeah, I think it was a soft EQ, but maybe we just don't know the full story here. I'll, we'll leave it at that. All yeah. right, uh, let's, uh, let's take a quick break and then we're going to get into, we'll stay on the track and we'll talk a little bit about, speaking of attempts to amplify the sport, we'll talk a little bit about this exciting new ne- announcement from Netflix about how it's going to get into the track game this summer. All right, and we're back. Jesse, track is getting the Netflix treatment. So it was announced in the last week, and you you covered this story as well, that Netflix is producing a docu-series about track and field sprinters heading into the Olympics. Now, I'll unpack this a little bit because it's actually kind of a bit confusing. So this story goes back a year. Netflix announced a year ago that they were putting together a six-part docu-series called Sprint. Uh, and I think at the, at the time, I'm not even sure if it had a name, but it's focusing on the 100 and 200 meter world-class athletes that were going into the world championships in Budapest last year. So by all accounts, there was this Netflix production crew that was following these athletes around uh, for the bulk of last summer shooting at like diamond league track meets and then at the world culminating at the world championships. So our understanding of what's going to happen next is they shot and it's in the can, the six part 45 minute per episode docu series is I guess allegedly season one of this, this show called sprint and then season two, or I guess maybe the second part of season one, it's not clear is being filmed right now in the lead up to the Olympics. And then we got clarification in this past few days that this whole series, presumably the whole thing is gonna drop at some point just before the Olympics. The Olympics start July 24th. So I'm gonna make a bold prediction here and say that we should be paying attention to our uh, Netflix accounts for this series right around July 17th, because they usually give you about a week of lead in before, uh, before the sporting event. My question for you is this, Jesse. Um, I think, it, I think everyone in the track world's excited about this because there's this hope that, that this will have what's called, I think the drive to survive effect, which is that F1 series, that sort of sprink, sprinkled fairy dust over F1 in the <laughs> aftermath of the first a season of that show. And then all of a sudden, all these Americans started getting into F1 and it created this really big F1 boom in the US. I think there's there's some hope uh, that that will happen with track. I know that, you know, you're a pro cyclist. I know that there was also an F1 series by the same folks. Um, do you think that this will have success? And did the did the tour one have the success that I think everyone was hoping it, it would have? Okay, yeah, so when I was like thinking about this, Mm -hmm. I did a lot of comparing to, it's called Tour de France Unchained. Yeah. Um, Docu-series, I know you love that name. I think the name is stupid. I think it's a stupid (laughs) name. Unchained, okay. There's a a chain on your bike. You call it like Breakaway or I don't know, like just, anyway. Anyways. The Peloton, I guess that's the name of the... The bike, bike. yeah. Yeah. Maybe not Peloton. Anyway, so there's a couple things I kind of like thought of here. And I'll start by saying, I don't think it will have the same success as say like Drive to Survive or Tour de France when I kind of think of that because I have better knowledge on that one. The first is because 
sprint they said they they're focusing a lot on like the preparation and the build up to these like big competitions whereas tour de france follows primarily just the race and the race is three weeks long yeah and i think by following the preparation it almost allows a lot of it to be somewhat staged and show like the best of an athlete of course they're going to sprinkle in like some some bad for the drama because if it's all like sunshine and rainbows no one's going to really care they want to see like people want to see the hard things like it's true it, it sucks but it's true they want to see the drama but with tour de france unchained they're mainly following the race and you can't stage what's going to happen in, in the tour de france every single day for three weeks like yeah. you're gonna see like some things go really well and you're gonna see some things that go really poorly and i guess people kind of know like that's you can't stage that like you can't predict who's gonna do what so i think that's one reason hmm. why it might not do so well the second is kind of sort of going off this like racing um perspective is that with sprint they're sprint races they're really really short they're like 10 seconds 30 seconds maximum which there's not a lot of drama that can happen in 10 seconds you know what i mean whereas in a four or five six hour bike race as much as i hate to see it people love seeing crashes they love seeing the peloton go down they love having to see people change bikes and the team come back and all that stuff and you have like I said, hours of that in a bike race, whereas with a sprinting, you only have that for 10 seconds. So I think that there's just a lot more like drama and a lot more dramatic elements in like an opportunities to film that in cycling versus with sprinting. So I think that's kind of just where it might be a bit harder to, to get that magic fairy dust, uh, to kind of make it work. Yeah. I, I gave this a lot of thought over the last couple of days and I started to go to this kind of meta philosophical place with this. I was like, okay, <laughs> why is it that the NFL or the NBA, why are these team sport or, or, you know, obviously premiership champions leagues, uh, you know, like why are all of these team sports super successful and financially lucrative and billion dollar industries unto themselves? Meanwhile, like track and field, Everyone does it in school. Uh, the vast majority of uh, people who, uh, you know, who 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 care at all about track or the marathon or whatever also do the sport or have done the sport at some point. So they have this like, you know, deep one to one relationship with the sport. Whereas like very few people actually played any level of football, of you know, in the United States or whatever, and they still watch it every single Sunday. I'm like, why is it like at a like boiling away all the marketing? Where where did all that come from? I started thinking about, okay, so team sports, you have the added component beyond just like the pure physicality of like being able to run really fast. So you also have, you know, the ball and the team element of it. I'm like, okay, is that enough? I started thinking about it more. And I think one of the really important parts about team sports that creates interest is the potential for like fallibility for like mistakes for errors and that creates drama and whereas with track particularly the shorter the distance like if there's like less and less room for or exposure of major error right um it's just like first past the post which kind of eliminates that human failing uh, element of it of like the greatest people in the world doing this thing at the highest level and also there being this possibility for for mistakes which creates drama so i i actually think i'm going to i'm going to zag on you in this one i actually think that this series particularly focusing on sprinters could be a real boon a real like success story for the sport because it allows us to see the fallibility the mistakes the insecurities, the uncertainty, um, the dramatic beats of a sprinter's life that we don't get to see because we get to see all we get to see is a, it's about a about a thirty minute show at the Olympics for the women's and the men's hundred and two hundred finals where each event takes about about let's say thirty minutes um, end to end. 
And it's the most exciting stuff of the Olympics. It's the, you know, heavyweight fight of the Olympics or whatever. And there's so much hype and there's so much tension around it. And then it gets sort of like unraveled like a, a spring coil being let go in that 10 seconds or, or around there, depending on if you're talking about the women's or the men's race. But it'd be really cool to see all the build up to that. And I guess my hope for this series is that it's probably actually not even like this kind of extended, let's call it all season one, because we don't know if it's like season one is the six and season two is the four, or if it's all going to be like a 10 part, whatever. Let's call this first block of episodes. Like I actually kind of want to get to like season two. I want to see what happens in Paris. I want to see the behind the scenes of, you know, uh, Noah Lyles getting ready for the Olympic for the hundred meter final and like how he behaves, you know? Um, and of course how he's going to be performing for the documentary cameras as well. Cause it's all a performance. Right. Uh, and then yeah. I want to see the outcome even like, say he loses, right. Cause he's the favorite going into the men's final. What or like, or Shikari Richardson, right. She's got this really dramatic story. She got, uh, sus she got, uh, suspended from the sport, uh, for like smoking weed or whatever in, in 2020. So she didn't race in Tokyo. And so this is a big like redemption story for her, but like, what if, what if she wins dramatically? What if she loses dramatically? Like, I, I want to see that play out. So, and I think that if the cameras are actually able to to capture that in an honest, um, unfiltered way, that could be really, really incredible for the sport and really incredible for us to watch as, as consumers of the sport. Um, but uh, yeah, that remains to be seen. I, I should say it's unclear who is actually in the documentary series. Although I did a like, did like a little bit of a deep dive on this and like pulled together a bunch of different reporting and sort of, and looked at some, looked at some tweets over the last 12 months. And I think it's, I can get you, get, here's the list here. Uh, I think it's Noah Lyles, uh, who of course is like, if you don't have Noah Lyles and Shikari Richardson, you kind of don't have a show. Uh, so they, she, so the, 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 the producers got both of them. Uh, the American Fred Curley, who's who's a bit of a character and who's been pretty outspoken about the need for for this exact sort of thing, so I think he'll be a, a good character. Um, Sharika Jackson, who's uh, the Jamaican athlete uh, who's won a bunch of medals and in the one and the two hundred. Uh, Dina Asher Smith, the UK athlete who was a two hundred meter champ in Doha in twenty nineteen. Uh, Mary Jose Talu, who is the from uh, Ivory Coast. Uh, Christian Coleman, the American sprinter, and Gabby Thomas. Uh, interestingly, you've reported on Gabby Thomas in the last couple of weeks about how she's getting into the entrepreneurial game with a pro track race, if I'm not mistaken. So it's kind of interesting that she's being that she's involved in this as well because she's like pro track events, like the event that she's been developing, uh, could actually be a competitor to the Olympics in the future. So good for her that she's like got this like kind of business savvy going on and she's inserting herself into this, into this docu-series as well. Um, let me just read you a, a quick quote that Curly uh, gave to the BBC last year and talking about the struggles that track has to promote itself. He said, people that, uh, people that don't follow athletics, they just tune in for the Olympic games we are bigger than the Olympic Games. The NBA has the championships. The NFL has the Super Bowl. We do more stuff outside the Olympic Games that deserves more recognition. Um, and he says, everyone in the world don't know who I am, but everyone knows who LeBron James is. To grow our names and grow the sport, you have to step outside of the norm that we've been doing for years and years and get that getting the same that are getting the same results. So like I think he nails it, right? He's just like, you do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. That's like the the definition of lunacy or idiocy. So, um, yeah. Yeah, like the Tour de France Unchained series had like a major impact on cycling. And like cycling is pretty similar to running in that like, you know, it's an endurance sport. Not a lot of people pay attention to it because um, it's not like a, it's a hard like income sport. Like you don't sell tickets to to games and stuff like that. You don't sell merch really either so <clears throat> i think that if this series can kind of have the same impact that tour de france did on cycling like i think that would be really really good for the sport because ever since tour de france unchained came out like that really did help the sport it really kind of brought us to that next level and like people are 
Yeah, it's like more cyclists are becoming household names and whatnot. And yeah, I think if we can get that with running and sprinting, that would be yeah really good for the sport and start to bring it up to that next level that it should be at really. Yeah, we should say that it it is this sprint is being produced by the same company that has now done um, the Drive to Survive, the Tour One, the Breakpoint, which is a, a tennis one that actually got canceled after a couple of seasons. I don't think it was as successful. Um, and then full swing, which is the PGA, the golfing one, which is still ongoing. And I think has had some success as well. Uh, although that, that series is being filmed like right in the midst of like the most, uh, uh, the most, uh, uh, sort of ugly time in pro golf, because there's this, like this, the, the Saudi live tour, uh, is starting to eat the lunch of the the PGA and I'm not sure exactly how they're handling that within the series because this is a PGA uh vetted and co-produced uh product and actually that would be interesting to see in future episodes of this uh uh future seasons of sprint if that were to actually happen if if it has enough success to keep going is how they handle these pro leagues that are coming up in 2025 like the the pro league that's that's coming up next year that I think will probably hopefully catch a little bit of fire. Be interesting to see if they they pick that up or not. Um, one thing that was kind of cool, and we'll 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 put a pin on the subject for now, uh, and I'm sure we'll be coming back to it. We can actually probably do a little bit of a a breakdown of the series after it actually gets released. Uh, we can do our we can do our like um, our, our our Siskel and Ebert and uh, and go back and forth on whether or not we think it was actually good after it's released. But the, one of the lead producers, um, from the, from the, of the show, uh, said, and this is the guy who worked on drive to survive. He's worked on all the shows. He said, his guy's named Paul Martin. He said in a podcast recently that, and I'll quote here, we were lucky enough to follow a group of athletes up to and including the world championships in Budapest. We're going to follow the same group of athletes, up to the Paris Olympics, which is amazing. It's a really amazing show. We had great success with Noah Lyles, uh, Shakari Richardson, Jamaican sprinters, Gabby Thomas. There's a moment in there, and I'm not going to ruin it, but there's a moment in the show that some of the best and most emotional scenes, scenes that we've ever filmed. You get to this stage where you've watched parts and cuts like 25, 30 times over the course of the show. And there's one particular scene in our sprint show that just kills me every time. It's so emotional. It's magical. I can't wait for people to see it. I think that this, sh that, that show is some of the best work we've ever done. It's like, whoa, okay, what is this? Yeah. I need to see it. So that remains to be seen. I'm curious to see if that scene he's referring to stands out in the series. I'm sure it will. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but yeah, we'll we'll circle back to this one after. I think probably around the Olympics when the show comes out. We'll we'll we'll, um, we'll chat about it. All right, let's take another break and then we'll come back with our last topics. I need no better tease than this. <laughs> Anti-sex beds. We'll be right back. All right, and we're back. Jesse, anti-sex beds. Why are they a thing at the Paris Olympics? Explain what anti-sex beds are. Sorry, I'm doing this to you. It's all right. So basically, at the 2024 Paris Olympics, uh, the beds the athletes will sleep in in their little dorms are made out of cardboard. Not only that, they're also single beds, so they're very small. And allegedly, they, it is to prevent athletes from getting another workout in with each other after wow. their competition. Um, but, but the IOC is saying that that's not the case. They're saying the reason that they have these beds is for sustainability and to think about the environment because they're hundred percent recyclable, which I mean is great, but <laughs> the Olympics are known for being, um, very promiscuous. Uh, there's lots of stories that always come out before and after the Olympics about previous and current tales of athletes mingling together. Um, yeah. So 
athletes and followers of the Olympics are saying that these beds are going to make it a little more challenging, but I don't think it will stop them because there's plenty of stories of athletes not using the bedrooms <laughs> for this type of stuff. So yeah. Yeah. We'll get into that in a second. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's there's been some there's been some reporting on this subject over the years. Like yeah. you just you just Google like sex athlete village Olympics and you just get like this. It goes back as far back as the internet goes back. Um, yeah, there's some great really reads does. in here. And the internet was a different time, like ten or fifteen years ago. Like even, the Olympics even, weren't. <laughs> the Evelyn Olympics were not. They have stayed constant. Uh, it's actually amazing what some athletes will say to a reporter in the yeah. in the era before social media in particular. Uh, I'm going to get into that in a second. But yeah, I guess so. So it's like a conspiracy theory here. It's the conspiracy theory is they the IOC is claiming, hey, these are sustainable beds made of cardboard. We're just going to pack these suckers up and put them in the recycling unit as soon as the games are done. Um, and... How, but the real thinking is you, a, a cardboard bed is not going to uh, handle some uh, some uh, brisk movement and would collapse, <laughs> meaning that uh, it would dissuade athletes from uh, having sleepovers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but I think that not just the athletes, but I think the IOC also knows that that's not really going to stop them because they're still going to be handing out um, a lot of protection to the athletes for the games. This is a weird. Okay, so I went down the I went down the uh, prophylactic rabbit hole. <laughs> and, I like uh, the rabbit on your hat for that one I, too. Yeah, indeed, and uh, <laughs> so I so there's a history of this. So like it goes all the way. I, I create. I've created a condom timeline at the Olympics. Oh. Um, 1988 Lovely. in Seoul, uh, there was the first time the IOC handed out condoms. I mean, at the time, HIV was a very serious threat and huge subject uh, globally. And to address that, the IOC uh, provided 8,500 condoms. They were freely handed out uh, at the Olympic Village. And... Uh, and I'll, I'll quote one of the uh, one of the stories I read from back in the day. It's officials found hundreds of them on roof on the roofs of the athletes' village buildings, um, and they actually banned outdoor sex at the Olympics during the Seoul uh, the eighty eight Olympics because of this because they were causing because like athletes were causing such a a mess of the grounds. <laughs> Uh, fast forward to 2000, the organizing committee, uh, decided to really kind of embrace the act, the reality of sex at the games and they distributed 70,000 condoms and that though that distribution ran out in less than a week and they had to come up with 20,000 more for, for week two. And then in, uh, I like, this is, this is a, this is great here. 2008. The Daily Mail somehow, uh, I guess, oh no, in the aftermath of the 2008 Olympics, the Daily Mail talked to the U.S. Uh, soccer goalkeeper, Hope Solo, who uh, admitted that she snuck a celebrity, she wouldn't say who, into her room and that she saw athletes having sex in the grass between the buildings. It's great stuff. I don't think she realized that, you know, her words would yeah. live on forever, but... Um, yeah, 2012, kind of famously, there's tons of stories about the London Olympics uh, and the promiscuity at the games, and, and Grinder even yeah. crashed during the yeah. 2012 Olympic Games. That's right. Yeah. So like the yeah. the the fledgling uh, uh, dating slash hookup uh, app and site in 2012. I mean, this was sort of like at the beginning of the apps. And uh, yeah, it crashed in the opening days of the games. Durex did this very clever marketing uh, marketing uh, uh, strategy, and they they released 150 thousand condoms. So that's that that's 15 per athlete, and there's only 17 days in the Olympic Games. Um, 
Yeah, and 2016 was nuts. 2016, it was like 450,000 condoms in Rio. <laughs> uh, it also got dubbed raunchy Rio. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And you know what I yeah. mean? Like, I won't, I won't name names here, but uh, got some friends that went to the Rio Olympics, and uh, I can confirm that it was indeed raunchy Rio. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, 2021 we could call the like um, the unsexy games because of like COVID and the protocols that were in place and they were moving athletes in and out pretty quickly. Uh, you weren't sticking around uh, and, yeah. and having a good time. And, and that's also the, the beginning of the anti-sex beds as well. Cause that's when they uh, allegedly yeah. first used the cardboard bed. Yeah. So it's actually the same company who made them for the Tokyo games that are making them for the, Paris games. Yeah. I mean, this makes sense. So like, I mean, to kind of go 30,000 feet on this subject, I mean, the, you're a pro, you're a pro athlete. And I think there's this kind of like no tomorrow kind of attitude at the Olympics. There was co coincidentally a, this statistician uh, released a, a meta analysis of all Olympians who have ever competed at the games and something like 73% of them don't make it to a second game. So it really is kind of like a no tomorrow. Like you're just, this is it kind of, uh, there's like a, 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 a dramatic feeling, a sleep away camp vibe to, uh, a, 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 your, the university experience, crystallized into one couple week period uh for, for yeah i was about to say i mean they kind of throw all these fit young athletes into these dorms together and it basically is yeah like you said the university sleepaway experience it's like fresh freshers week for them <laughs> oh god yeah <laughs> all right well, we'll leave it at that i uh i you know hopefully we don't have to do some any follow up reporting on this? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I am. Um, yeah, and I will. I teased earlier before the pod to uh, to Jesse that I I've got a little bit of wonder, some wonderful gossip from games past, but I'm gonna keep it. I'm gonna keep it in the vault. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna name names. Um, no. Yeah, yeah. It's. Oh, the Olympics. Can't wait for them to, to, to begin. Okay, uh, that's it for our show this week. Uh, promiscuous Paris coming up. You've named it. You did it. You did it right there. Ronchi Rio to Promiscuous Paris. Um, yeah, we'll have to, we'll workshop the Tokyo one. It's got to be a, like the sad version. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Treacherous Tokyo. No, we, we, yeah, no. no, for different reasons. I'll work on that one. Yeah, we'll but I think Promiscuous one. Paris is good. Yeah, abstinent Tokyo, but that we need a T there. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to do a pod later. We're going to do a, like a, a group chat style pod later in this week. I think we're settling into our rhythm. We're going to aim for Mondays and Thursdays, I think, um, going f moving forward. Uh, so make sure you subscribe to our podcast and give us a five-star rating. It would go a long way for us in helping our fledgling pod grow. Uh, watch the pod on YouTube. We do a video version of the of this podcast if you're watching right now hey thanks for watching um and uh and subscribe to our newsletter it goes out three times a week jesse writes one of them she wrote today's it's uh it's great it's always filled with great stuff and uh, including we share when the latest episodes of the podcast are coming out uh all right that's it for the show